Hello, everybody. This is our ecology lesson number five. I don't know. They're all blurring together now. Um, but so here we go. I'm going to start by sharing my screen as usual. And we're going to go into the part two of the lesson. Okay. The last lesson we did was about cycles, right? Nitrogen cycle, water cycle, carbon cycle. This is completely unrelated. Okay. So it's a little bit easier of a concept to cover. So get your standby brainstorm partner person. I'm going to ask lots of questions. See if you know the answers and because I can't hear you tell me the answers, I hope there's someone that you are saying them to. Okay. So today's lesson is about biotic and abiotic influences on ecosystems. So when you are straining an ecosystem, how can different abiotic factors influence how successful an ecosystem is at surviving? Okay. I have mentioned in our first lesson what we would consider a biotic interaction, okay, species interaction that can fall under the biotic category for ecosystems. Okay, so before we go into this, we're going to discuss a concept called a limiting factor. Okay, what do you think a limiting factor is called, uh, it means, okay, when I'm talking about a limiting factor, what do you think that is? Okay, so discuss it with somebody. In chemistry, I think we call it a limiting reagent, okay? So this phenomenon can also exist, not just in ecosystems, but in chemistry, in chemical reactions. So a limiting factor is essentially anything that can restrict the growth of an organism, whether it be restricts the quantity of species that can duplicate or survive or restrict the size of an organism, okay? So limiting factor, is any factor that can restrict the size of a population or where it can live, okay? So a limiting factor can be both biotic and abiotic, okay? So I want you to think of an example uh, of the, a list of abiotic factors that can influence the size of a population, okay? So whether if you make some of these things more available, you can have more species, or if it becomes less available, then you have less species. So they give a list of those for abiotic. And how would you in your best terms describe what a biotic factor would be that is a limiting factor? So pause, discuss. Okay. So abiotic limiting factors are pretty kind of common sense, things like nu uh, nutrients in the soil, light availability, whether you're a producer trying to grow, soil acidity, um, water precipitation, water availability, all those types of things, the salinity of water. So es essentially we're looking at the quality of abiotic factors. Is there enough light? How is the quality of soil? Is there enough water? What is the temperature like? What is the weather like? Okay. So let's write these, please. So abiotic factors are looking at the temperature. Is it too hot for organisms to survive? Is it too cold for them to survive? Or is it in this range that we call just right? So like Goldilocks style. Light availability. Is there enough light available for plants? Um, typically the growth of plants, um, small plants in the base of uh, a densely grown forest suffer from lack of light availability. Okay, so that can actually be the limiting factor that causes some plants to die. Soil acidity or alkalinity, which is what we described before, the side effects that can happen if the soil becomes too acidic or basic. Water availability, is there enough water for plants to grow? Water quality, is, it, um, is there turbidity in the water? Is it too salty? Is it too fresh based on what it needs to be? And precipitation, is there enough rain to, to, to allow all the plants to grow and all the organisms to have the water they need? So for biotic, this is all the different types of uh, species interactions that you can look at. Okay, so let's write this. Biotic refers to interactions between living organisms. Okay, and also the availability of food. So is food available to those consumers? So if you, if you alter an abiotic factor that might prevent the growth of a producer, 
that might biotically influence the consumers. Okay, so for example, here we go. Have a, we have a cactus. I want you to choose an abiotic factor to adapt that would cause it to die. Take a look at the climate of the cactus. How could you adapt one of its abiotic conditions, thereby causing its death? So, so the example I came up with is if you overwater that cactus, it will start to rot and therefore die. Now let's take a look at our lizard or gecko. What could make this guy die if you're looking at an abiotic factor? Choose an abiotic factor to tweak. So for this one, let's drop the temperature. Dead lizard <clears throat> or gecko, okay? So now this graph is going to look at the top, pause for a second, you gotta go. Every dad, it's not me talking in the microphone. Every single noise is heard. Really? Yeah, like, come on. Screen sharing is paused. I don't know if everything is. Okay, you gotta go. You're making too many noise, too much noise today. You're just you're bored and distracted. Go, go. You're useless today. Okay. Right. This is, it's not like there me was, talking. Was a bird uh, was I know, okay, but, uh, go. What was this Terrible student. Because uh, every noise is heard, right? Yeah, close the door. Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry, everybody. I paused the video quickly. I was trying to teach this lesson to members of my family, but they are not uh, as good students as you are. They are not paying attention, so I had to kick some people out. All right, but the rest of us, hopefully you guys are still here. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a graph that represents a concept called tolerance range. What range of difference can there be in limiting factors, okay? So let's say you are a plant. At what range is it too hot for you to survive? At what range is it too cold for you to survive? Whichever range of temperatures is a survivable condition, this is now called the tolerance range, okay? So it actually looks like a bell curve. So take a look here. Uh, the y-axis represents the size of the population. The x-axis represents the different extremes in the abiotic factors. So for example, cold, cold, warmer, warmer, hot, 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 okay? Any kind of abiotic factor can be um, investigated. Basic soil, basic soil, slightly basic neutral soil, acidic soil, very acidic soil, right? Um, but ultimately, the tolerance range is the range of conditions that the species can still survive in, but outside of that range, they cannot survive. And that in between there is called the optimum range. Okay, so some species can handle changes, whereas others cannot. Okay, this is the one we were talking about, why um, a warmer ocean can cause the effect of some death of some species if they have not acclimatized like we, are, we have. They don't have some of the survival mechanisms that we do to adjust our body temperature um, because we've evolved to do so. Okay, so let me give you an example here. I want you to think of an example of an abiotic factor that can restrict a fish population at very high or very low levels. So the hint is, I just told you. <laughs> so fish temperature. So they have evolved to be suited to a narrow optimal range, okay? If the lake gets too hot, too cold, the fish will die. Think about plants. What is a common limiting factor for plants? So we've mentioned a few, okay? So you might be thinking, okay, how acidic or basic the soil is based on the last lesson. Yes, but typically a naturally sustainable ecosystem it's not the soil that is the issue, but things like drought, water availability seems to be the major um, restricting factor of the growth of plants. Okay, so here's the diagram to represent, again, tolerance range, but now we are looking at plant growth, okay? And we're looking down on the, uh, the abiotic factor that we've chosen to investigate in this diagram was temperature, okay? So the tolerance range, is specific to abiotic conditions, 
okay? So the range of abiotic conditions within which a species can survive. Okay, so the range of abiotic conditions within which a species can survive. All right, so now we're going to investigate something similar that, uh, to our first lesson, which human actions can affect abiotic factors. So try to be specific here, okay? So you are going to provide a proposed human action that will affect abiotic factors in both land-based terrestrial and water-based aquatic ecosystems. All right, so here's your table. This section, I definitely want you to pause, discuss, okay? So let me introduce them first because the next slide is going to say everything at once, okay? Like this. So I want you to think of the ways that humans can affect the amount of light that's available um, on land to plants, okay? How do we affect the quality or the quantity of water available to plants. What is it that we're doing that decreases the amount of water available to some plants? Okay, this one's pretty clear. What are we doing to affect the, the soil, the nutrients in the soil? What action is it that we are doing that adapts the amount of nutrients in the soil? Temperature is nice and obvious, I think. What are we doing? How, how are we changing the temperature for land-based organisms? Okay. Acidity of the water, try to think back. We're not just talking about temperature of the water. Well, actually they're related, um, but there actually is a direct way that we are increasing the amount of acid in the water. It's a twofold way that this occurs. Salinity, how did we discuss that we are increasing the saltiness, okay, of certain aquatic ecosystems. Please pause. I want you to take some notes. I want you to discuss this and the answers are going to come up in a second. Okay. Light. Any kind of clear cutting exposes organisms to light. Okay, so it actually increases the amount of light available to many plants, which you might think is beneficial, but at the same time, it's <laughs> where we typically do what is called clear cutting, okay? We cut down almost all the trees. So this benefit of getting more light, it's not actually a benefit. It causes um, side effects of erosion of soil, et cetera, et cetera. Water, we can increase water availability, okay? If we wanna irrigate, okay? So divert rivers towards certain areas, but keeping in mind, if you divert rivers by too much, that can indirectly affect the salinity of the aquatic ecosystem. So maybe we have the ability to divert more water to land-based ecosystems, but you know that that is taking it away from the aquatic, okay? Nutrients in the soil. So I just wrote farming, that's very simplified. Uh, now, based on our prior lesson, uh, we'll discuss this more, but we do things like fertilize. So we artificially put nutrients in the soil. And the more we fertilize, the more we fertilize, plants be can become dependent on that fertilizer. And as we've said before, the soil can become more and more acidic as time passes. Okay. Temperature. This is our global warming connection, right? Fossil fuels are burning. Burning releases CO2 into the atmosphere. Extra CO2 causes something called the greenhouse effect. By extra CO2, the, the heat stays trapped within our atmosphere longer. Our world starts to increase in temperature, causing something called global warming, okay? Aquatic ecosystems, there's, this is a twofold. So I only read, wrote one. I would like you to write the other as well. So yes, with our pollution, our SO2 and NOx, we are also increasing the amount of acid rain falling down onto the bodies of water. But don't forget, as a side effect of global warming, we are increasing the rate at which carbon dioxide dissolves into the water as well, increasing the quantity of carbonic acid, okay? Salinity is again twofold. Number one, we directly salt roads and that erodes into the water sources. 
okay? But then it also can affect salinity by decreasing salinity as the glaciers or ice melts into the salt water. And then the third way is that we can increase salinity of certain parts of the ocean when we irrigate, okay? When we divert rivers away from the ocean so that we can uh, have good water sources for our terrestrial ecosystem, that is affecting the salinity of the ocean that never gets the fresh water mixed in anymore, okay? All right, now the next one, we're going to finish off with our aquatic ecosystem. Okay, so pause, write the rest of this down. The next one, now we're going to look at our aquatic ecosystem. How is it that humans are affecting the amount of light available in the water? Okay, there's a couple of ways that we do this. And then, the, then another way, how do we change the amount of nutrients in the water? And then the temperature one, I think is pretty clear. Okay, but the light one is, is quite indirect. You know that we're not creating more sunlight on lakes. So how is it that human actions are changing the amount of light available to aquatic life? Okay, and then think of our, our actions on land and that actually affects nutrient availability, okay, in the water. And I'm gonna say that there's one more connection to be made when nutrients become high in the water, that goes back to affecting light. Okay, so pause, discuss it. All of these are human actions, okay, so not part of a natural ecosystem, okay? Quick pause, and I will come back to you in a second. Okay. So for light, it is actually the behavior, one of the things is the behavior we do on land. So let's go back to the previous slide. So we are clear cutting, right? So we are clear cutting ecosystems to get the wood, right? That causes a phenomenon of erosion. So now soil is not anchored in, okay, by all these roots. It erodes into rivers, it erodes into our lakes, blocking, uh, making the, the waters murky, cloudy, blocking the sunlight to the plants down below, okay? Another thing is any kind of activities that we perform in water, whether it's speed boats or any kind of ship, it is stirring up the lakes, okay? So this can actually stir up or cloud the water. So please write these down as I discuss, because I will post the, the answers next, but you can take notes as I talk. Nutrient availability. We fertilize the land, then it rains. Then that fertilizer seeps into um, anything, surface runoff, through flow, uh, percolates down to the water, groundwater, everything like this, okay? But ultimately, now you have these nutrients growing in the water, okay? So, I mean, you would think that that's not a problem. So now, hey, we're, uh, we're providing all these nutrients to these plants in the water. Okay, so now these plants are st start to grow. But these create things called algal blooms. So there's so much algae now that they can grow over the surface of the water and block the sunlight underneath. So plants underneath those, the, those algal blooms will die, okay? And now because of that, the water actually can become what we call hypoxic or anoxic. So it's actually very low levels of oxygen are now in the water, causing organisms to die. Okay, so, and then the last one is temperature due to increased CO2, increased greenhouse gases, trapping of heat, we increase the temperature, okay, of water as well. So let's write these please. Tree cutting increases erosion. Activities in lakes, fishing, boating, ships, stir up, cloud the water. Nutrient availability also affects the amount of light. So the runoff from our agriculture creates something called an algal bloom. You are essentially fertilizing the water. So some plants can overtake. So this process is called eutrophication. Okay, so fertilizers into the water, more algae covering the surface of the water, 
blocks the sunlight, water beneath the surface, uh, plants, sorry, water plants beneath the surface die because they are no longer contributing enough CO2 um, oxygen. The water actually becomes hypoxic or anoxic. There actually has less oxygen within it because of all those aquatic plants that have died underneath that thin layer of algae that has grown. And of course, the global warming. All right, so let's finish off with the different types of biotic factors that we've discussed before. All I've said before really was the concept of species interaction. So I want you to pause the video. I have five that I'm going to teach you. I hope that you can guess at least four. Okay, pause the video. Think of four different types of species to species interaction. Okay, here we go. I hope that you guys came up with predation because we've mentioned that one before. Competition. Remember how we talked about that symbiotic mycorrhizae relationship between the roots and the bacteria? Okay, so where both of them benefit each other, we call that mutualism. There's also a circumstance where um, an organism can live and eat off another organism. What would that be? So that is your parasitism. And then there's that, th th there's those species interactions where one is benefited, the other one really isn't affected or doesn't care very much. And that is called commensalism. All right, so let's begin. I'm going to read out the definition you are going to guess which type of relationship it is I have just defined, and you are going to come up with some examples. Okay, so here is the first definition. Please write it down. Two individuals seek the same resource. The same resource. So which one is this? Okay, so please start writing it if you know it. This is your competition. Okay, the next one. One individual feeds on another. This one, the wording is slightly confusing. Um, you can think of it this way. One individual attacks or... <laughs> Okay, but attacks another, but this concept of feeding on one, it's, it's not parasitism that I'm referring to. When it's one individual attacking and eating another, I want you to write predation. Okay, next one. Two individuals benefit each other. So, which one is that? Where two individuals benefit each other. This is our symbiotic relationship, symbiosis, which is also called mutualism. Okay, so symbiotic, mutualistic, symbiosis, mutualism, they're all essentially the same term. Okay, so two individuals benefit each other, that is mutualism. This one, it goes like this. One individual benefits and the other is not affected. All right, so what is that one? One is benefiting, the other one is not affected at all. So that is your commensalism. Okay, the next one, it's best described like this. One individual lives on or inside an organism and feeds on it. So that's important to, to say, not just feeding on it. So one individual lives on or inside an organism and feeds on it. Okay, so that's the key here for our parasitism. Okay, so please pause the video again. Try to write any examples on the side. You definitely know one for mutualism. Commensalism is actually hard to think of one, okay? But it exists out there. 
and parasites. Hopefully you can guess which uh, some examples of those. Okay, so please pause, come up with your own examples. Okay, so this is what I got here. Competition, there's so much competition out there, but I tried to include one including humans, just so you can understand that we are part of this whole food chain. We are competing with insects for the same crop plants. I'm only mentioning that example because when I teach on, um, uh, sorry, what is it called? Pests, pesticides, all of that. Um, we're going to call insects that eat our crops pests, but I mean, ultimately, it's just us competing with other organisms that want to eat the same food, right? They're only a pest by our standards, okay? Predation. This one, again, you can see out there in nature. Uh, let's say lion eats a hyena. I'm just using examples from Lion King right now. It's pretty terrible. Lion eats an antelope, okay, or a gazelle. Mutualism, that is our nitrogen fixing bacteria, our mycorrhizae, okay, so that is a specific term for that type of symbiotic relationship. Birds nests in trees are a good example. Uh, moss living on bark, that's a good example of commensalism. It doesn't negatively impact those trees. And our parasitism, tapeworms that can grow inside the intestines. Okay. And different microbes, okay? So there are different parasites that can actually cause malaria. Uh, it's called the plasmodium, okay? You will learn about this in grade 11. Okay? All right. So I, I, I usually like to kind of try to put some pictures up just to get students to remember the lesson, okay? That's what we're going for here. So competition, ready? You want the rabbit. No, you want the rabbit. No, he wants the rabbit. No, she wants the rabbit. Okay? They're all competing for that rabbit. Poor rabbit. Okay? But another type of competition. You want the seeds. No, you want the seeds. No, you want the seeds. No, you want the seeds. Another type of competition. Now, predation, I just decided to use the exact same slide prior, right? Predation. So you're going to be the predator of the rabbit, which is your prey. Okay, so all of this is a type of predation. This one, <laughs> hopefully, okay, just prepare yourself, is also a type of predation. They feast on us, okay? They don't, they're not parasites because they don't live on us, but oh, good goodness, I'm going to change the slide because this is disgusting, okay? Here is your, oopsies, sorry. Here is your mutualism example, okay? So the whole, the bee uh, helps pollinate the flowers, but it gets the um, nectar out of the flower so it can make its honey, okay? So this is a mutualistic behavior. Pollination and obtaining nectar. This is our mycorrhizae relationship. Mentalism, so again, the leaves, sorry, the, the nests in the trees. And then this one as well. So try to think, there is something that lives on whales, but it doesn't influence them negatively. Does anyone know, what is it called? The thing that lives on whales. They are called barnacles, okay? So it looks gross, but these can exist and live on whales. The whale is totally unaffected. And then for parasitism, I just tried to find some disgusting pictures of tapeworms. Okay. Okay, our last term for today is called carrying capacity. So what do you think that is? Spend a quick second, draw a graph. Okay, maybe a line graph. And I want you to draw what would happen if you think population growth has hit its carrying capacity. Okay. So here is what I should see. If a population is growing, 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 okay, whether it's exponential or um, geometric, sorry, geometric is the term we use for consistent growth. Um, whenever you see it plateau, Okay, 
that's how you know it's hit the carrying capacity. Sometimes it can actually kind of look like a bit of an activation energy. It surpasses this carrying capacity and drops back down and then plateaus. But in your assignment uh, that I'm going to hand out today, um, you're, you're going to look at a graph that you create and try to find its carrying capacity. So you are looking for whatever part of the graph it starts to plateau and can stay stable at that. So based on this, the carrying capacity is the maximum population size that an ecosystem can support. Okay. All right. So it is the maximum population size of a species that a, a given ecosystem can support. So then one of your questions might be, well then if this is the maximum population size it can support, how come there's there are sometimes an overshoot and then a drop back down to the carrying capacity. So think about it yourself. In nature, how is it possible then that there can be an overshoot and then a drop? So it's kind of like living, um, what's that saying? Living over your means or something like that. Maybe those organisms can survive for one year, okay? There's just enough food for one year, but eventually some of them will starve and will die off because there are simply too many of them to sustain, okay? So they might survive for a season, but that quantity is not sustainable over a long period of time. Hence why some will die, whether it be from um, starvation or disease or any kind of sickness, and then it will plateau at that carrying capacity, okay? So what happens? As a population size increases, the demand for what also increases. So what did we say that connection was? You increase the population, it's demand for resources also increases. So if that population keeps going, eventually there will not be enough resources. Sorry, that should have been one line down, but let's write that. Eventually, there will not be enough resources for each individual to survive. If you surpass that limit, you have passed its carrying capacity, but this number where they can survive and stay stable is your carrying capacity. So the upper limit that an ecosystem can support. Okay. So what I consider the most interesting question, we've already discussed this idea that um, humans are living outside their means, uh, somewhat unsustainable. So let's discuss what is human carrying capacity for Earth? What is the upper limit that the earth can support for human population based on our needs? All right, all right, so first, earth carrying capacity. Write down a guess, okay? How many people can we sustain in this earth before we run out of stuff? Okay, so come up with a guess, all right. First, you need to know how many people are in the world currently. So based on my uh, research today, we are currently at 7.6, not 7.4, okay? So it has been going up over the years as is predicted. So we are 7.6 billion. The predicted carrying capacity for Earth and this is keeping in mind that you still have Western civilization living the way it does, okay? The current carrying capacity predicted for the Earth is at 9 billion. So the scientists are saying that up until 9 billion, we are, are golden. Uh, but once we bypass that, we will start running out of vital resources, okay? This is based on the availability of fresh water and the limit on how much food our earth can produce. And of course, I'm sure that you guys are thinking, okay, well, with new technology, we will find ways to grow more. 
plants in a smaller area. And yes, that is being looked into. Um, it's kind of like um, apartment buildings simply for plants. Okay, so rather than using one whole plot of land, we can layer it up, up, up different floors. Okay. Now, there is something that we can do to up our number to 10 billion. Does anyone know what we could do? Even if we still kept Western civilization the way it was, um, what could we do to up our number to 10 billion? So think about it. So if we wanted to up it to 10 instead of nine, if the whole world became vegetarians, we would have a new, um, sorry, we would have a new carrying capacity, believe it or not. Now, let's go back. If we all ate like us, okay, Western society, if everyone ate like the average North American, okay, how many people do you think we'd actually sustain in this world? Believe it or not, 2.5, okay? So it really kind of opens up your mind into understanding that think of this earth as one ecosystem that right now is reaching its carrying capacity and we need to figure out a way to either artificially make some changes to increase carrying capacity, behaviorally make some changes to increase carrying capacity, or deal with the repercussions in the future. All right, everybody. Uh, that is it for me. Uh, right now you have essentially two days to work on the lesson of the kebab handout. I hope um, it works so well for you. And that is going to be it. I'll stop sharing my, my screen and say goodbye to everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe.